Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today I'm going to talk about electrification. Now this is a thing, this is a hot button for a lot of people. Um, you know, we love our, uh, our internal combustion engines, we love the noise, the smells, well maybe not the smells so much, the vibration, the feel of a good naturally aspirated engine, but there's a lot of electric showing up on the roads today, and it's getting to the point where there are some really solid reasons why you might want to electrify your car. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the reasons why you might want to, if you are interested in that, and also the high level of what would be involved. Um, I'm not going to give you a full rundown of exactly how to do it. I'm not going to show you a build of how to electrify a car or anything like that. I'm just going to talk about the main things you might want to take into consideration if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you want to do it. If you have any questions during this presentation, if you're watching live, throw them in the comments. I will do my best to answer them. Um, I do have some helpful assistants behind the scenes here who are reading these and trying to stay on top of it. Um, if you have questions when you're watching this in the future, then uh, throw them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them in the comments. Now, you might be wondering why I'm standing here with two very much not Miatas behind me. And the reason is because these are actually two very similar cars in a lot of ways. That's an E39 M5. It's about 4,000 pounds. It's about 400 horsepower. And it was the original Uber saloon, if you'd like. Um, a very high-performance car sold by BMW, obviously, around the turn of the century. This is a 2002 model. Fantastic car. I love it. I've owned it for about 10 years. The other side, one of the best-selling cars in the country. Best-selling car in Europe. This is a dual-motor um, Tesla Model 3. Not the performance, just sort of the standard four-wheel drive. It's got 430-something horsepower. It's about 4,100 pounds. It's a four-door sedan. They're very, very similar cars. And it, but it's interesting to compare the two of them in terms of how they feel. And that difference in feel is a big part of what is driving electrification today. When you go to the SEMA show this last year, it was all about electric conversions. And the reason for that is because not only is there a crackdown on emissions that's affecting our industry, but also there's just the sheer, there are positives, haha, <laughs> literally, um, to the electrification. Comparing these two cars, They've got those very similar stats, but they deploy their performance in a totally different way. This thing's got eight throttle bodies. It's got great throttle response for a naturally aspirated engine, but it's completely blown away by the throttle response on this thing, or the accelerator pedal response would probably be more accurate. It's a very, very immediate hit. All that torque is deployed instantly. It's deployed over a very wide range. You don't have to shuffle with the gears to try to make sure you're in the right rev range to make full use of your power. It's just always there all the time, and it hits hard and fast. It tapers off a little bit at higher speeds. This is more of the Autobahn monster. But that instant hit, that immediate response, is actually a real driver towards why a lot of people are looking at making performance-oriented electric vehicles. So let's talk about what's going on here. There's been electric Miatas for a quarter century. I mean, I'm going to focus on Miatas because we're a Miata shop. There have been electric Miatas for decades. I came across my first one back in the 90s. Um, over the years, I've received many phone calls from uh, EV DIY builders, mostly to do with their suspension, because they'd throw in all the batteries, the motors, and stuff like this, and then discover the stock suspension was not up to the job. Um, so I got the chance, as part of setting up their suspensions, to see a lot of the weight distribution, the weight gain. It was all over the map. I mean, every electric man I made has been completely different in terms of his implementation. And then the calls dried up for a while. And the reason is because mass market stuff started showing up. You didn't have to roll your own if you wanted a golf cart Miata. You were able to buy things like a Bolt or a Leaf. Your electric performance was available. Most of those early builders were not necessarily looking for performance. They were looking for a cute little car that ran on electricity for whatever green reasons they wanted to. But there's been a resurgence in interesting electric uh, Miatas because of that performance capability. Now we can build Miatas that are electric and are significantly faster or have significant performance benefits um, compared to gasoline engine ones. So that's why we're looking at this. There are, certainly is lots of prior art out there. Um, Zero EV has done a fairly major YouTube series on building an NB Miata. Um, we've sponsored a high school team that, uh, that built one for, a, for an SCCA style uh, competition. Um, they did very, very well with it. They built an electric NB for that as well. So we're starting to see more and more of them come out using this new generation of components. And I think that's why this is becoming interesting right now. We are at a point where the available technology is making it possible to do this well and do it without really handicapping a lot of the rest of the car. 
Do we have any questions uh, that have popped up yet? Mike. As high-tech safety crash prevention equipment in the new modern cars, especially electric cars, are becoming more relevant, do you think that speed limits across the country and other places will continue to increase? Okay, so the question is basically, are speed limits liable to change because of increased safety in vehicles? That's essentially what, uh, what Mike is, uh, is asking. I'm not going to go there today. <laughs> um, the increased increase safety of, of vehicles or the changes in safety are not really tied to the power plants. So the fact that a vehicle is electric, the fact that this thing has a bunch of crazy safety features that this thing doesn't, is more a matter of the fact that this is 20 years newer. So I'm not going to, and I'm not even touching the third rail of autonomous driving today. We're just looking at what's making the wheels turn. So we'll stick with that. So I've got two and a half years of experience of living with an electric car. I've, I've heard a lot of the, the pluses and minuses to it. Um, I think for a Miata, for short-term performance use, uh, and short-term, I mean, you know, going out to play with it for a day, going for a Sunday drive with your Miata club, or a blast through the gap, something like that, I think it's actually really well suited. Uh, and one of the reasons is because the range, this is what everyone's concerned about, you only get 200 miles of range or 100 miles of range or whatever, the range resets to zero every day because you plug it in at night. So you get that full range every day starting in the morning. So the whole range anxiety thing almost turns on its head. I mean, I have no idea how much gas is actually in the BMW right now. I know that this thing has got a very high percentage of its battery capacity because it was plugged in last night. So I just don't even think about range anymore unless I'm on a road trip. So I'm going to go through a couple of the concepts and of what you need to know if you're going to be electrifying your Miata. I will warn you that we are not electric vehicle experts yet. We are electric vehicle enthusiasts. Um, I'm learning as much as I can about this stuff. I've talked to a lot of people at uh, the SEMA show. I've been to a lot of uh, presentations at the SEMA show, talking to people from AEM and folks who are in the industry. I've seen behind the scenes some pretty interesting little projects that haven't quite broken ground yet, um, or haven't uh, broken into the public perception. But I have not done one of these myself. I do not cannot get right down into the level of how to build your own battery using 18650 cells. Um, we're not going to get into that today. So I'm going to start with the obvious thing, the motor. This is one place where I think we're seeing a really big improvement in EVs and why these are becoming much more effective. The old school way of doing an electric Miata, this is what I used to get the phone calls for, the one I saw 25 years ago, was get a forklift motor or something, jam it on the end of the transmission, stick a bunch of batteries in the trunk or wherever the heck you can stick them, and then just drive it all through the gearbox. That's the old school way to do it. The batteries back in the day were probably lead acid. They probably weighed literally a ton. Um, the problem with that, you don't get a lot of performance. You're still stuck with the gearbox. You're losing a lot of efficiency in the gearbox. Your gears are probably incorrect. Uh, and of course, there's all the weight of those old school batteries. So there's a couple of that sort of way of modifying them is falling out of favor. And the reason is because of the wide torque curve available, especially with the new AC motors, um, high voltage motors, you don't necessarily need the gearbox. And the gearbox actually becomes a liability because it's, I mean, you know what we can do with two Miata gearboxes with turbochargers, as much as you can do with EV torque. Uh, they become redundant. So the next best thing to do is to get rid of the gearbox completely and just put a drive shaft coming off the back of the motor. This is what Chevy did on the Project X uh, hot rod project car, um, they had it at the SEMA show. It has the engine from a Lyric. No, what's, is that the, the um, Lyric and the Ionic? The Lyric is the Cadillac. They had a Cadillac electric um, engine in there, turned sideways, they'd blocked off one of the outputs and they'd driven the back. Uh, they'd, they'd stuck a drive shaft in the back going to the rear end. And that was how they electrified that car. Gets rid of all the losses in the drivetrain. It allows you to, um, allows you to use the gearbox that's integral to the motor and means you don't have to worry about shattering that old school transmission anymore. Yes, you lose the joy of, of rowing through the gears, but we'll get to transmissions and gears in a moment. So that's the second way to do it. You still lose a bunch of power by having to turn the, the drive 90 degrees at the rear differential, but it's a fairly easy way to do it. It works well for old school cars especially. The way I like to do it is to put the motor in the rear subframe, in the case of a Miata. And that's how the Tesla works. It's got a motor in the rear between the two wheels. It's got a motor in the front between the two wheels. And so there's no reason to turn the power 90 degrees. There's none of those losses. It basically just you have a motor that is effectively a self-driven differential. 
and then two drive shafts coming off or half shaft coming off it, and that drives your wheels. And I think that's the way to go going forward. Um, you have to find a motor that will package, but you'd be amazed at how big a motor you can package in the back of, say, an ND without getting into moving control arm mounting points. Uh, the Model S, the big drive unit from Model S, the big 450 horse one, will not fit inside that box. Just about everything else I've looked at will. So that's my, my preferred way of doing it. The, uh, the Zero EV um, construction that's on YouTube, I believe they did the second method where they attached a drive shaft to the stock differential and ran the power through that way. It's a fairly easy thing to do on a car constructed like a Miata. My preferred method would be go the other way. And the reason why that's my preferred method is because we're starting to see a lot of motors that are built for this. Back in the day, or you know, even back five, ten years ago, we just had motors that just, they were industrial things that had a single output. They were perfectly suited to attaching a drive shaft. Now we're getting a lot of production cars, Bolts, Teslas, et cetera, that have these integrated motor transmission units that can fit in the place of a differential. So the aftermarket is, being able, is able to use those parts now. And they're not just being taken out of production cars that have been crashed. There's other manufacturers, Blackwell Motors, for example, I talked with them at SEMA, um, where they are making drive units designed to be retrofitted, designed to be put in whatever. Do we have any uh, pertinent questions at the moment, Mike? Sort of. So um, with all these different changes in how drive lines will eventually evolve to accommodate these things, what kind of differences in the center of gravity can we expect from changing from ice to electric? Okay, so the question is basically with all these changes in technology, what effect does that have on the center of gravity? Um, and I will actually, that will probably work out well when I start talking about batteries, because the battery is the big chunk of weight in these cars. I mean, in the, in the M5, the biggest piece of single, single biggest piece of mass in the car is the engine. On the electrics, it's going to be that battery pack. So the location of the battery pack, the size of that battery pack, the choice of that battery pack, that all has a lot to do with the center of gravity. Um, doo -doo -doo. So the manual transmission thing, a lot of people seem to think that this would be a, you're losing a big part of the fun of driving if you don't have a stick shift. Fair enough. I respect that, uh, I respect that concept. I have a lot of stick shift cars. That thing's got a stick shift in it. It's fun rowing your own gears, but you have to remember what the manual transmission is there for. It's there to allow you to make, to, to always be in the power band, to make use of the power delivery, the torque delivery of an engine that doesn't have a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, this, the BMW makes its peak power up near red line, so if you really want it to perform, you've got to be flirting up near red line all the time. You don't have a big, flat curve. Now, if you've been driving Miatas for 30-odd years like I have, you've noticed that the amount of torque down low, the spread of that torque curve has been getting greater and greater. Mazda's been chasing that from the beginning, and it's what customers have been asking for. We get a lot of phone calls from people saying, hey, I love my 1.6 Miata, but I want a little more power down low. I love my 1.8 Miata, a little more power down low. I love my NC. I want a supercharger, a little more power down low. And the same thing, over and over again. And so we're trying to get more and more of an electric style power band out of these things. Now, the reason we have that, uh, that manual transmission is to allow us to make sure that we're in the right part of the rev range. A high voltage AC motor has a huge power band. You don't really need the transmission anymore because there's just always this huge amount of power. If you've ever looked at a dyno chart from one of these things, they're basically flat. And so the transmission is not really necessary in order to make sure the engine's in the right rev range anymore, except for extreme cases such as Porsche with their Taycan doing a two-speed transmission, so they have their Autobahn burner gear so you can still rule the Autobahn, and then you have your normal one for driving around town. If you're willing to accept 150 mile hour top speed, you don't really need that transmission anymore. And again, they're fragile. They break. Um, transmissions are inherently inefficient, and inefficiency if you're chasing miles per gallon is one thing, but if you're chasing not losing your horsepower, we like efficiency. So that's why it doesn't really make sense to put a stick shift in a modern electric car. As much fun as they are, you have to learn to enjoy that platform for what it is instead of what it is pretending to be, if you understand the, the difference there. Um, do we have any more questions? Not, nothing that's a... <laughs> Mike will jump in when the time comes. All right, so... Batteries. We'll get, I'll get to the, the other bits and pieces that you need to sort of put one of these things together, but the other big one is battery. And batteries are interesting because they're actually a big factor in your performance. I mean, we think of them as simply being, like with your cell phone, the size of the battery is how long it runs. But in the case of an electric vehicle, and if you're on RC cars, you probably already know this, 
Um, the case of an electric vehicle, the size and the, the features of the battery have a big impact on the performance. Um, that wide torque spread that you get, for example, out of a high voltage AC motor is because the battery is able to continue to, to deliver power longer than it is in a lower voltage system. Or if you've got a big battery, it's able to deliver more power at a time than a small one. The reason for that is batteries are rated in, there's a, there's a rating called C, which is basically how quickly it can discharge. And the higher the C, the faster it can basically deliver a slug of power. And that's rated in a percentage. So if you have a battery with a, with a C of one, which means it can completely discharge itself in one hour, um, then you know, 100 amp hour, or a battery with 100 kilowatt hours can deliver that over one hour. Now, if you take a battery with twice that capacity, you can deliver twice as much power, even with the same battery rating. So it's, you can think of the battery cells as like little tiny fuel pumps. Each of them can only deliver a certain amount of fuel. The more little fuel pumps you have, the more fuel you can deliver, and the more performance you get. So that's why batteries are really interesting, because the really big batteries, you know, the long range, longer range cars, have higher performance because they can deliver more power at, over time, um, or more power immediately, and also deliver it for longer because they've got that bigger capacity. So I've heard a lot of people talking about, oh, I'm gonna make an autocross Miata, and autocross Miatas in gas cars, you run with like a gallon in the tank to save as much weight as possible. So thinking the same thing, I'm gonna get an autocross Miata, I'm gonna put like a 10 kilowatt hour battery in it um, so that I can get the maximum performance because it's the lightest weight. The problem is they're not gonna get the horsepower out of it. Um, because there's just their little tiny fuel pumps, there aren't very many of them. It's an interesting, interesting trade-off. And when you're building your own um, electric vehicle, you have to trade off the cost, obviously, the weight, obviously, uh, the range, and the performance. And the range and performance are more interlinked than you think they are. Mike, do you have something over there? You're twitching. Well, we've got a few more coming in <laughs> about batteries and Tesla parts and Yotas. Okay, um, I'll get to that in a moment then. So that's a big thing about batteries. And an interesting thing is that hybrid batteries, batteries taken out of, say, a Prius, are often better for performance reasons because they're designed to discharge more quickly than batteries in a Tesla, which are designed to have a very long life. Um, so it's actually kind of interesting, depending on where you get your battery from, those, those hybrid batteries might have a higher C rating than, say, grabbing them out of a wrecked Tesla. Um, one thing you, you also want to make sure you're doing is maintaining your battery, taking care of it. I mean, we've all, we all expect short lifespans out of batteries because of the way that cell phones are, you know, they're high performance batteries for two years and then they're dead. Um, these are much more sophisticated in terms of their battery management. So you need a battery management system on board, especially if you're gonna be pushing it hard, you really need some sort of cooling. Um, that's one thing that helps the battery last a lot longer because of course, anytime you're delivering, you're moving huge amounts of energy around, you're losing some of it as heat. And so you have to be able to keep the battery from getting too hot. Um, Nissan did not do that in their Leaf, which is why the Leaf exhibits a lot more battery degradation than, say, Teslas do. Um, the battery in this car should probably last about the same sort of lifespan as a good internal combustion engine. You know, general lifespan, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of miles because it's got a sophisticated battery management system. So if you are looking at doing a retrofit, you'll want to put that on your shopping list. Make sure you've got something to maintain your battery, to make sure it doesn't overcharge, doesn't over-discharge. Uh, and make sure that it's, it's monitoring its, uh, its discharge capability, its speed, and it takes care of the battery, basically. Um, there's a lot of this information, by the way. Uh, AEM, of all people, has a very good AEM, or a very good EV selection. They do a lot of parts for EVs, um, and they've also got some very good FAQs, some good ex explanatory videos. Um, I think the website is aemev.com. Um, but uh, there's a lot of good information there if you want to get a good idea of the bits and pieces you need. And of course, they sell the parts. Um, they're working with Ford, I think, on some of Ford's aftermarket uh, support. For example, you can buy the rear engine out of the Mach-E uh, from a Ford dealer, assuming they have some in stock, but they've published the part number. You can buy that thing, and then you can use AEM parts to make it work. One thing to know about batteries is you don't need to necessarily match the batteries to the motor. So if you want to use Leaf batteries with the Tesla motor, or vice versa, whatever, you can certainly do that. Electrons are basically electrons as long as you can control the battery properly and you have enough communication that the, um, the engine control unit is able to get what it needs out of, the, out of the battery system. Again, AEM has some very good information on this. Mike, do we have any questions um, 
that are appropriate at the moment, or shall I move into sort of the high voltage systems? Um, most of it at the moment is talking about what components will fit from the Tesla and that kind of stuff. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mike says most of the questions we're getting right now are will this fit in here? Will this fit in here? Remember, I haven't done this. I've done a lot of research. We've done 3D models of some of these engines. We've looked at, okay, does the Cascadia integrated power unit fit inside an ND rear subframe? Yes. Um, does the Model S large drive unit fit? No. Does the Model 3 large drive unit? Yes. Um, you know, what can fit where? That's a little more difficult to, uh, for me to answer right now. But this is why this is such an exciting time for electrifying classic cars like Miatas, <laughs> classic cars, or newer Miatas, because there's so many good options coming on the market right now. You've got all the stuff that GM is putting together and GM is planning on selling to the consumer. They're controlling the access to stuff quite a bit right now, and they've got a small battery problem. The Bolt's had a little bit of a battery supply problem that is uh, causing some problems. But um, Ford is also selling some of these parts, and of course there's all the wrecked cars you can pull stuff out of, like Bolt's and the new, uh, the new Hyundai's are looking pretty interesting. Um, the new GM series of modular batteries, modular motors, stuff like that. We're at a point right now with a lot of really interesting options hitting the market. And so I can't give a cookbook or a recipe because I think the ideal recipe is still changing. Right now, the Tesla is the small block Chevy of electric swaps because there's more of them out there than anything else. They make stupid amounts of power, some of them. Uh, and they're old enough that you know, they are showing up in junkyards. So they are the one to use right now. I have a feeling we're going to start moving to a, little, to a few more different options depending on packaging as time goes on. Um, I will show you, actually, before I get into the high-voltage stuff, I'm going to show you an interesting little car. Here we go. This is the Lanark DS. This was, on the, uh, this was in the Haggerty stand, of all places, at the SEMA show this year. Um, bonus points if you spot those taillights, even the headlights. But this is based on an NB Miata uh, suspension, at least, more or less structure. It doesn't have the floor pan and everything, but it is based on an NB Miata, and that's the size that it is. But this has got a Tesla drivetrain in it. Model X batteries down the middle. Um, Tesla large drive unit, I believe, in the back. I think that's what they're using. They're using one of the Tesla units in the back. Um, this is going to be the subject of a Discovery Plus show. I don't know what it's called. Um, my friend Ant Anstead... Uh, was involved in this thing, so I'm sure there'll be lots of promotion of it when it comes out, because Ant's good at that. Um, but that is an example of a Miata-sized sports car, fully electric. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to hear a little bit more about that one as time goes on. I need to catch up to see what's going on. But, I mean, people are building these things. Yes, Mike. talk about electric cars in different temperatures and climates? I'm going to talk about electric cars in different temperatures and climates. I was going to talk about uh, heating, ventilation, and cooling. <laughs> One of the big concerns about electric cars in cold climates especially is, of course, batteries become less effective as they get colder. Um, you have to expend some of that energy to keep warm because one of the nice things about uh, internal combustion is that it wastes an enormous amount of its energy as heat. The most efficient internal combustion engines are hovering at about 50% of efficiency, and those are Mercedes F1 engines. Um, so half of that energy that's being burned or being exploded is being turned into heat, and that's very handy in cold temperatures because you can use it to keep the meat inside the car warm. These things, much more effective, much more efficient, unfortunately. So you do see a range hit because you don't have all that extra energy being wasted that you can, you can recoup to keep yourself warm. Um, the flip side is they don't have cooling problems in hot weather in quite the same way. Yeah, it works, works both ways. If you're looking to build an electric Miata, you're probably not too concerned about how it performs at minus 30 degrees Celsius, so I'm going to just bench that one for now. But, uh, but yes, you do have to take that into account that there are some changes. I've driven this thing over our mountain passes in February in snowstorms that looked like they were going to close the roads. I've driven it down in single digits Fahrenheit. Um, I have not noticed a significant range hit enough to change the way I use the car which is the important part. Um, if that change in range is, it's there, but it's not really affecting how you use it or what you do, it's more theoretical than real. So it is a real thing. Whether it's actually an important thing to you, it depends on usage. So I'm going to talk about the high voltage system. And this is the sort of stuff you get off that AEM EV website because this is more interesting than, than talking about you know, all the reasons why you don't want an electric car. Let's just say you do 
that's how you get it. So this is something that's interesting because it's, it's good to know what all these parts are that you need. I mean, you need a battery. Okay, we know this part. We're going to talk about the high voltage part, which is basically the drivetrain. Anything that would involve gasoline in the uh, internal combustion engine. So you've got your battery. We've talked about your battery a little bit. The batteries usually have some contactors on them, which are basically big relays that isolate the battery. They turn it off. So think of them as a kill switch for your electrical system. And there's fairly good reasons for that. There's a lot of potential energy in that battery. Um, and you can release it uh, unintentionally. That's the exciting part about doing your own EV is that there's a lot of safety precautions you need to take. But there are some big contactors in there. They're basically effectively relays. And you can hear it when, say, the Tesla turns on. You can hear a chunk from under the car as those big mechanical relays close and allow the battery to actually do stuff. Um, you also have inverters. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is where the important stuff. And this is usually built on top of the, on top of the motor. The battery is DC, positive and negative terminals. Um, the motors these days are AC, which is very similar to a brushless DC battery in terms of the way it works. But effectively, most modern performance EV motors are going to be AC motors, which means you need something to turn that DC power into AC. And that's what the inverter does. And it also controls effectively the amount of energy being put into the motor. I mean, it's basically at your throttle is what that thing is. And they're usually built in on top of the motor because you, you are transferring an enormous amount of power um, into that engine through there and you want the run to be as short as possible. So they're often packaged right on top of the motor. They're obviously integrated directly into it. Uh, and they need cooling as well. So you will see cooling because of the sheer amount of energy involved. You'll see cooling pipes going into the inverters. So if you're looking to do a DIY electric car, you'll need an inverter somewhere. If you happen to pull it out of a bolt or something like that, it will probably be, bolt, be right on top of the motor. Um, the Cascadia motors I mentioned earlier, um, they're available with and without integrated uh, inverters for packaging reasons. But if you can, you want to keep it as close as possible to the motor. Um, and again, it kind of depends on what you're using for junkyard parts. Uh, you will need a VCU, which is, did I write down what that stands for? Um, Vehicle control, voltage control unit maybe. I honestly, I should have written that down uh, is what it stands for. But that is basically the thing telling the inverter what to do. That's your, that's your ECU. You know, think of it as a mega squirt. <laughs> um, there's a couple of different ways to get a VCU for your car. AEM will sell you one. Um, you can use a hacked factory one, which is basically similar to the ECU. You know, when we build an LS Miata, we use a factory ECU for those things. We tell it some lies to make sure that it works the way it wants to. Or we can use an aftermarket ECU. Holly sells aftermarket ECUs for those, um, you know, mega squirts, that sort of thing. And so it's the same sort of choice. You, you have more control with the, uh, with the aftermarket unit. You may get more power out of it. You have more work to do. Same sort of thing. So you can think of the VCU as like an ECU. You will need something to basically control that system. One interesting thing about high voltage systems and EVs is that the wires are a very specific color. There's actually sort of an official color for the wires. They're a bright orange, um, so you know what they are. So when you pop the hood, um, there's one spot where you can sort of spot one of the wires on this thing when I open the, open the frunk. Um, but there, you see them when you're seeing pictures of EVs. You'll see these hot orange wires running through there, and that is, don't cut those. Bad. Um, you also need a uh, charger, obviously, to charge the battery, unless you want to go in there with the alligator clips every night. Um, usually the chargers are, are on board, so you'll need to take something into account there. That if you're building a car out of a donor, you'll probably want to do that, just take the one out of the donor car. Building a car out of a donor, you can repurpose a lot of the parts that are in there. Uh, and there's a few other safety things in there, such as um, there's often some sort of isolator, some sort of, well, it's a, it's a pyro fuse in the case of the Teslas, that will actually separate some of the banks of the batteries. It'll drop the voltage down, or it will cut the power to the, from the battery completely. Basically a big fuse. Um, and then there's, in the middle of all that, in the middle of all this high voltage stuff, which is basically an RC car, um, you've got a DC to DC converter, which is you can think of as an alternator because you still need your low voltage system. You still need your 12 volt system to run headlights, to run your radio, to wake up all of the electronics for the rest of it. I mean, that's the part that is basically acting like a normal car. So you've got a DC to DC converter that's effectively it's an alternator. It's charging your 12 volt system. This thing has a normal battery in it, just like any other car. Um, that is used to keep everything else alive uh, and turn it all on. And like I said, radios, all that stuff. So if you are doing a conversion of a Miata, you'll keep 
pretty much all of the existing electrical system that's not tied to the engine as is, so your turn indicators work, your headlights work, your radio works, um, that all runs off the 12 volt system and the DC to DC converter is your bridge to that system. Mike, do we have anything going on? Nope, keep talking, he says. Okay, you, you will also likely want a cooling pump to cool your motors, um, to cool your, your batteries. Doesn't need the sort of cooling that an internal combustion engine does, but you do need to stay on top of, uh, of the cooling levels of those things. And because these tend to be fairly modern cars, there's a lot of CAN communication. I've done a video in the past on what CAN is and how it's integrated, but that's going to be one of the challenges on trying to get these things to play nice with stock controls. So the I was going to say the stop-start button, but that's a little less important in an Miata. But if you want to integrate things fully into, uh, into an existing car, you'll probably need some sort of CAN converter, some sort of CAN bridge to, uh, to relay messages back and forth if necessary. There's some interesting stuff you can probably do there. Um, HVAC, so your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, that's where you can probably get the best parts for those salvage cars. Um, there's, I haven't looked. I'll bet there's a, a complete air conditioning heater assembly on these things. These things have a 400-volt uh, AC compressor, very effective AC on a Tesla, let me tell you, it's amazing. Um, they have resistive heaters, some of them have heat pumps. That's the sort of thing that you probably want to harvest out of an existing car because the OEs are in on that now and they've got OE levels of engineering, so don't reinvent the wheel. You can get your HV basically out of a salvage EV, I think is the best way to do it. Uh, brakes are an interesting one. You're going to need a vacuum pump for your brakes. Um, the ND Miata already has one, actually but you will need a vacuum pump to make sure that you do have power assist for your brakes. Um, but you also need a good parking brake because these things don't really lock themselves in gear. You can't park it in gear the way you can an ICE. So ICE, internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, so you do need a strong parking brake. So it may need to be electrically actuated or something tied into the system. There's some interesting things you can play with there, but you don't have to take that into account. It's got to have a good strong handbrake or some sort of parking brake because otherwise it's going to roll away. Um, and one of the questions I've seen, I've had a lot, is can you hot rod these things? And you can. You can increase the power output of, say, these Tesla motors. Again, I keep going back to Tesla, but that's because they are, there are more of them out there than anything else. There's been more hot rodding going on and everything else. Things I say about hot rodding Tesla motors also apply to Bolt motors, to Lyric motors, to Ionic motors, to whatever the heck. Um, but uh, AEM, again, has some very interesting stuff on their site. They have some dyno tests showing how the battery affects the power output they can get out of it. And it's a pretty significant amount of change. They can, they can bump the voltage a little bit, uh, but if they have a battery with really big capacity, very high C, they can keep the voltage up longer before the field strength starts to fall down. Um, and basically, more power, longer. Good. We all like that. We all understand that. So there is some hot rotting available. And some of that comes down to the, the VCU, which I'm going to say probably stands for Vehicle Control Unit by this point. Uh, <laughs> um, it comes down to the VCU's programming. Again, that's like a mega squirt raising the boost on a turbo car or, um, or you know, say a turbo diesel where you're just throwing more fuel into it. It's got a lot of the same sort of attributes as that. Uh, questions I've seen. Can I make my own batteries? We're not going there today. Technically, yes. That is like the hardcore DIY people. Um, I would rather just harvest something out of a crashed EV Personally, because it's got the cooling capabilities in it and that sort of thing, um, the Zero EV YouTube channel does have a little bit of a peek into a modular battery system, how they assembled it. They actually have cooling in there. That's a good little breakdown there. If you want to solder your own out of 18650 cells, um, you know, stolen out of vape pens or something like that, yes, you can have a good time. Um, <laughs> now, how do you get the weight down? This is one of the questions, and this goes back to the question we had earlier about the center of gravity. Because the biggest chunk of, battery, of weight in the entire vehicle is the battery pack, if you can get the battery pack under the floor, low and central, that's a great place to have weight. I mean, if you're going to have weight, you might as well have it there because the center of gravity is low, um, the polar moment is low, that's where these things are. I mean, you're sitting on top of the battery pack on one of these things, and you'll see pretty much every production EV is built that way. Um, you know, the Mach-E, for example, is built that way. It's got a little extra bit under the back seat, a little bit of bonus battery sort of stuffed in there. But generally speaking, they're all, it's a skateboard chassis concept. A um, little harder to do when you're retrofitting, unless you want to make the floor to your Miata this thick. Um, you're going to have to find some place to stash the batteries, and that's going to have a big effect on where your center of gravity is. That's in the past, as I said, historically, I've seen a lot of, um, 
a lot of corner weight numbers for electric Miatas, and they've been all over the place because that battery location choice has been all over the place for every builder. Um, as the batteries get higher density, uh, we're starting to see them, you can slide them into more interesting places, they're smaller, uh, so there's more options available now. The transmission tunnel is the obvious place to put them if you're going to be putting the motor in the, uh, in the rear subframe. And that little, that little uh, Miata-based thing I showed you the peak of, um, I don't think I'm spoiling anything with that. It was on the, on the floor at SEMA. Um, I think it had them down the center, and there was some underneath the hood as well. It had a lot of battery, and that thing has a lot of battery capacity on it. Um, so one of the questions we have, or we, we get a lot, is will Fly Miata be making electric conversion kits? I don't think we have an answer to that one yet. We have a lot of people who are very interested in the idea here at Flying Miata because of the performance aspect. Um, as you know, we are taking emissions very seriously here. Uh, we have emissions legal turbo kits for three to four generations of Miatas, and we have had emissions legal force induction for that, third, that fourth generation as well. Um, you know, it's a focus of us to make sure that our products are clean, partly because we have to live here. Uh, and partly because, of course, the EPA is not a big fan of emissions elite stuff. So there's that aspect to it, but there's also just the sheer performance aspect. The fact that a normal mass market, um, normal car, can have the performance level of what was 20 years ago, a very highly engineered, very high-end BMW, is, I mean, that's tempting. That's really interesting. So, yes, we are interested in EVs here at, uh, at Fly Miata. We certainly would like to do an EV conversion. We've got lots of plans. Uh, we've been playing around with things. We've just been waiting for the right moment, the right collection of parts to sort of come together, the right availability of motors and batteries so we can get the packaging and weight that we want. Um, will we offer conversions if we... It's unlikely we'll do turnkey conversions or push-button conversions, whatever you call a converted EV. Um, but we will... If we develop an EV Miata, it's very likely we'll end up selling parts. I don't want to make promises but it's something that we are very interested in because of the performance potential, because of the attributes of those electric cars. I think there's a lot of really interesting things we can do. Um, will we be making electric conversion kits for all Miatas? Well, <laughs> uh, the three basic platforms are all very different, so it's likely that we would only make... Uh, we'd start with one <laughs> and then work our way through the, through the kit. Um, a lot of the questions we have in here are questions about flywheel-based electric assist systems. And this is where I think we're going to see that hit the mass market first because Mazda has said that they're going to electrify the next Miata to some extent. They have not said how much. A lot of people jump immediately to pure battery. Um, I think it's going to be an electric assist hybrid. Basically, they'll put a small motor in there that will be deployed. It will be used to fill in gaps to, to give you an extra little punch off the line. Basically... All that stuff that we've been trying to get with a little more displacement on the 2-liter, um, you know, trying to improve the torque range of the Skyactiv engine of the Miata engines over the years. I think it will fit into the Miata ethos very well. You'll still get to, to shift the gearbox around, but there will just be a little more underfoot. I think that's what we're going to see from Mazda. It's a little harder to do in the aftermarket because you've got to insert that into the powertrain somewhere. You've got to find some place to package that motor uh, and make it work well and smoothly and invisibly with the internal combustion setup, which is a lot more difficult than making it work on its own. So I can't see us coming up with any sort of electric assist thing, some sort of just powered flywheel. Um, I know about that very sexy little motor that Koenigsegg has recently come up with. Um, I'm a little concerned about the potential price tag for Koenigsegg stuff, but even though it is such a small motor and it is so well suited for an assist motor, trying to package that into an existing car I'm not, and not destroy the transmission, I'm not sure how that would work. So. Um, as much fun as a, uh, a flywheel-based electric system would be, I think it's unlikely we would go that way. I'd like to see someone do it, though. It would be an interesting retrofit. Doo -doo -doo. Here's one question. Would the ideal electric Miata have one motor or two? And this is, an interesting, this is an interesting question because it comes down to torque vectoring. I mean, can you, you can use control of, of uh, the torque at each wheel to help drive the car around the corner. I mean, we've talked about this to a certain extent. It got mentioned in the, the kinematic posture control video we did a couple of weeks ago. But you can use that for a lot of stability control. Um, torque vectoring like that can really help with turn-in. Um, it's actually a very effective tool if you have access to it. And you can do it with two motors. Um, I think packaging-wise, that's going to be an OE thing because, again, the, 
it's hard to shoehorn that in. Um, but it's also something where the software is, is not an easy solve, so it's quite likely it'll be the OEs that will be solving that problem first. Um, about a four-wheel drive Miata, a motor in the front, row in the back. I may have maybe asked Dave Coleman about the possibility of putting drive shafts in the front uprights of an ND Miata, and he basically told me to go away and stop bothering him. Um, no, that knuckle is not shared with anything else. You cannot take the front end off a CX-5 and jam it in an ND Miata and get four-wheel drive, unfortunately. But that would be fun, too. Uh, might have to move the shocks, because I don't know if you've ever looked at the layout. The drive shaft would have to go through the front shock absorbers, which is an interesting packaging challenge. But Bluetooth, yeah, Bluetooth drive shafts, as, as so often seen on SEMA builds, yes. Uh, Mike, do we have any questions there that uh, you think are, nope? We are answering all the questions. Now, one question is in here, and that always comes up, is that people are always convinced that there's a revolution about to happen with batteries. It's great to get a lot of headlines saying, I've got this new glass battery, we've got a solid state battery, we've got this, that. Um, maybe? I mean, there's been the 100 mile a gallon carburetor has been around for forever. There's always been this great breakthrough with the crazy new internal combustion engine where the whole, the whole crankshaft is going back and forth. I mean, fundamental changes. It's about that same sort of level of thing. I don't think we're going to see a step change in battery technology anytime soon. We're going to see a lot of evolution of, of battery technology. I mean, the, the current, the, the Teslas that are two years newer than this one have a different, slightly different battery pack um, chemistry. They're packed a little differently. Um, they have more energy density. The price of batteries has been dropping dramatically, even though you don't realize it. So I think that's the sort of thing we're going to continue to see. We're going to see evolution of the existing chemistries, the existing sort of batteries. We're not going to see a battery this big that will power a car for 3,000 miles and get swapped out at Walmart on weekends. Um, that's unlikely to happen. So I would plan, if you're doing, going to do an EV conversion, you probably don't have to wait for the next great thing in batteries because it's kind of like fusion power. They've been almost ready for... 20 years, um, but still just hasn't happened yet. I think that's about all I'm going to cover today. I've been rattling on for a while about this. Um, if you haven't experienced a good electric vehicle, I recommend take the chance to drive one because they really are interesting to drive. They, they behave very differently than an than a, um, internal combustion car in terms of they deploy their their power is so hard and so fast. They're quiet. You realize how much of a fuss internal combustion engines are making all the time. Um, they're just plain easy to live with. Uh, one thing we discovered over the weekend is the ability for the car to preheat itself when you're inside at a concert and you come outside and it's 30 degrees and the inside of the car is cold and you've got to wait for the big diesel engine to generate enough heat to warm up. It's kind of nice to have the ability to preheat um, without having to run the engine. You start to realize, if you spend some time in electric, how much we have adapted our behaviors, our expectations to the way an internal combustion engine runs. And we do love that. We love the noise. We love the, the vibration. You know, I've got a Miata that shakes itself when it springs at idle, which makes me laugh like a kid every single time because it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything, and it can't sit still. Um, you don't get that with electrics. 100% true. I mean, there's always going to be enthusiasts who just love the interaction, the noise, the sound, the poisonous carbon monoxide gas that comes off an internal combustion engine, and hey, no, we're going to keep working on electric, on uh, non-electric Miatas forever. I mean, Fly Miata will always be there to support those. But we have to, you know, we have to pay attention to what else is going on. There's some very interesting stuff. It'd be like ignore, ignoring fuel injection because carburetors are so easy to tune. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. There's a lot of very cool stuff that electric propulsion brings to the table. And if you haven't had a chance to experience it, I recommend you give it a try because it actually is quite interesting um, to actually experience the way this, these things work, the throttle response, the, um, the speed, the, the hit of acceleration you get off them. It's, uh, it's quite entertaining. So if you have questions, we'll do our best to answer them in the, in the comments. We're not going to be able to get into the whole, can I put this motor in here with this battery pack and what do you think of this? Um, we will leave that to the, the solid experts on EVs, but hopefully this will give you a little bit of an idea of why you might want to do it, how you might want to do it, and what you need to take into account when you're going to do it. And uh, this opens up the doors to a lot more research and learning, which is, hey, research and learning is fun. So thanks for your attention. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please check out our other videos, like, comment, subscribe, all the good social media stuff. Uh, my name is Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and we'll talk to you again soon.